nature is made possible by public television stations, your gas company and America's gas industry, supplying natural gas across this land of ours, providing gas energy to fuel industry, warm homes, heat water and cook meals for over 160 million people from coast to coast. This week we visit the world's greatest wetland, the Pantanal of Brazil. Hi, I'm George Page for Nature. Wetlands are among the richest and most productive of all environments, home to both land and aquatic animals. The Pantanal is in the southwestern corner of Brazil, which long ago was covered by an inland sea. Today it occupies about 40,000 square miles and drains the center of the entire South American continent south of the Amazon basin. The Pantanal is a unique environment, supporting a wide variety of creatures, and it has become the last stronghold for several rare species. It's October, the end of the dry season in the heart of South America. Oppressive clouds build up day after day. But no rain falls. The rhea, a South American relative of the ostrich, searches for seeds and grasses on the parched land. The giant anteater hunts ants and termites across this low-lying savanna in southwestern Brazil. A vast floodplain almost the size of France, it was once an ancient sea. This is the Pantanal. During the dry season, life concentrates around the permanent waterways. A dense strip of forest lines these flowing oases. Water hyacinth, known locally as aguape, and some other water plants shelter masses of fishes. Cormorants are common here, even though it's more than 800 miles from the sea, their usual habitat. A striated heron. The anhinga catches fish by stabbing them with its dagger-like beak. If this hasn't killed it, the anhinga will pound the fish on a log or a branch. Then it tosses the fish into the air, catches it in its beak, and swallows it head first.
As the sun's rays pierce the river canopy, the heat becomes intense. The cormorant spends much of its time swimming and fishing underwater. During the heat of the day, it emerges from the river to dry its waterlogged feathers and to preen. Places, the river widens to create quiet backwaters filled with luxuriant vegetation. These provide a haven for many of the Pantanal's aquatic inhabitants. This is a South American crocodile or caiman. Known to Brazilians as a jacare, it's one of the major predators of the Pantanal. It feeds almost exclusively on fish. Its beautifully shiny hide is highly prized for leather goods, making the caiman the target for vast armies of poachers. It makes for the bank to bask in the sun. Like all reptiles, it regulates its body temperature by controlling its exposure to the sun's warming rays. Sometimes, rarer creatures are found in these quiet backwaters. A tapir, a true relic of ancient times and one of the oldest mammal species on the earth today. It weighs about 500 pounds and is related to the rhinoceros and the horse. It grazes on vegetation both above and below the water. Its prehensile snout is extremely sensitive and acts as an extra limb, which it uses to get its shoots and leaves that it can't reach with its teeth. first storm of the rainy season gathers. The atmosphere is changing. start in late October and become more frequent as the months go by.
can rain as much as two inches in an hour. The rivers swell. Fish, unable to see clearly in the muddy water, become easy prey for the caiman. As the rainy season progresses, the whole character of the Pantanal changes. The rivers overflow, and there are shallow pools of water everywhere. The Pantanal becomes a marsh. The dry savanna is transformed into the largest freshwater marsh in the world. New vegetation springs up from the seeds which have lain dormant throughout the dry season. The fish move into these rich new feeding grounds, and the caiman follow. Other reptiles leave the rivers, too. This yellow anaconda is about 12 feet long and moves effortlessly through the water. It's an opportunistic hunter, capturing whatever small mammals, birds, or reptiles cross its path. During the dry season, the anaconda is confined to the permanent waterways. As the land becomes flooded, it moves away from these in search of food. But it's never found far from water. The rains continue falling over the Pantanal, and when the conditions are just right, the frogs begin to breed. The males call at night, staking out their territories and attracting females. The rains also bring out the apple snails, so called because they can grow to the size and shape of an apple. During the dry season, they've lain dormant in the ground, where they buried themselves when the last year's floods dried up. They emerge now to mate and lay their eggs. The female climbs up a plant stem, it's the only time in her life when she voluntarily leaves the water. She climbs until she's far enough above the water for her eggs to be safe from the rising flood. She secretes two egg-like blobs of sticky mucus, which she drives up the groove in her foot by contracting the muscles on either side. The first egg is now carried up the same groove. Each egg is slightly pink because of its high albumin content. A sticky protein-based mucus protects it from drying out in the heat and helps to glue the eggs into a cluster. They appear at about 30-second intervals, 
and she lays between 100 and 150. She deposits the egg so that each fits into a neat and stable geometric pattern. This ensures that the cluster will hold together while the baby snails are developing. When she's finished, she secretes more white blobs of mucus, which secure the cluster to the plant stem. Then she simply withdraws her foot and drops back into the water. morning. The water level is still rising. Over the past few months, Rain has fallen over the Bolivian foothills and the surrounding high ground which borders the Pantanal. These waters pour into the Pantanal's main river, the Paraguay, which bursts its banks and floods the surrounding land. The Pantanal changes character again as these new floodwaters flow across it. It has become a broad, shallow river covering an enormous area. The moving water displaces many of the inhabitants. The praying mantis takes refuge from the still rising water. Small frogs do their best to hang on to lily pads. A variety of aquatic plants flourishes in the flood. This freshwater turtle lives mainly on apple snails, which feed on the vegetation. It rises to the surface to breathe, but spends as little time there as possible before continuing its search for food. This caiman lizard is no threat to the turtle. It's also looking for snails. It's an excellent swimmer and spends most of the day in the water. It's called the caiman lizard because of its resemblance to that South American crocodile. 
it can grow to six feet, one of the world's largest lizards. Although at home in the water, this giant anteater has struggled a long way through floods and tangled vegetation. It's exhausted. When the rising waters have covered most of the land, only small islands of raised ground remain. These islands are known as Kapow, and they soon become refuges for animals fleeing the swirling waters. The exhausted anteater finds a safe place to rest at the base of a giant fig tree. It does sometimes use its powerful tail to lash out at attackers, but it's more commonly used to protect itself when resting. It has incredibly dense fur and leathery eyelids to protect it from ant bites. The giant fig tree provides both shelter and food for these howler monkeys, also displaced by the flood. They will remain here on the Kapow until the floodwaters subside. As the flood continues to rise, the vegetation flourishes. Marsh deer, which have spent the dry season near the permanent water, now move in to feed on the lush new vegetation. These deer, the largest in South America, are superbly adapted to living in the marsh. They have specially evolved feet. Between their toes, they have a membrane, a sort of webbing, which helps to spread their weight and enables them to move securely in the slippery conditions. They're always on the alert for predators. This jaguar does not appear to be interested in the adult female. She snorts to warn her fawn. It panics. Then its mother panics. Now, in water over its head, the fawn has to swim. But it reaches shallow water and escapes. Frustrated, the jaguar moves on. and the mother rejoins her baby. The jaguar is the largest predator in the Pantanal and is entirely at home in the water. This marshy wilderness is one of the last strongholds of this magnificent cat. 
he moves on through his territory. It's mid-March. The floods are at their peak, and the Pantanal is at its most beautiful. In April, the flood starts to recede, and the floating vegetation is stranded. As the water continues to recede, the snail kites arrive from their breeding grounds in Argentina to feed on the apple snails. Since the snails live at the bottom of the channels, the drop in water level makes them more easily accessible. At this time of the year, they become an important source of food for many of the animals and birds. This female is competing with the male for the best perch from which to hunt snails. He chases her away. Unlike many birds where male and female share territories, this rivalry is normal between snail kites. Finally, she's driven off. And the male continues his search for snails. These perches form a very important part of his territory. They provide the best vantage points from which to hunt. Success. He uses his uniquely adapted sickle-shaped beak to cut the muscle which attaches the snail to its shell.
The snail kite is not the only species dependent upon snails. The limpkin, having first pummeled the snail with its beak, now uses the beak as forceps to extract it. Another bird in search of snails, the plumbius ibis. It uses its beak as a probe to find snails, which it swallows, shell and all. Six weeks after being laid, the young snails have formed inside the egg cluster. As the embryos develop, the albumin level drops and the cluster changes color from pink to grayish white. Inside, the young snails increase in size and their weight breaks down the individual compartments. They slip into the bottom of the egg cluster. Soon, the weight of the young snails and their fluid is enough to rupture the cluster. The embryos of water snails must develop in a liquid environment. Once the cluster ruptures, the liquid is released. And the young snails drop into the water. They have soft, translucent shells, which amazingly harden on contact with water. Apple snails are not only important as a source of food in the Pantanal, by voraciously eating the vegetation, they also help to keep the waterways clear. It's June, and the floodwaters continue to subside. The land is drying out. Channels begin to appear as the water drains into them. The fish, which had spread out into the floodplains when the rivers overflowed, now move back into the channels. As the water level falls, the fish become concentrated in the channels and are easy prey for the many wading birds which gather here to feed. These birds arrive in great numbers, roseate spoonbills, snowy egrets, and great egrets. The spoonbills sweep their beaks back and forth using their peculiar flattened bills to filter crustaceans from the water. Only adults sport the scarlet epaulets. The juveniles are paler. This capybara is making a scent trail using the gland on its nose. Later, it uses the trail to find its way back to good grazing. The capybara is the world's largest rodent. A big male can be more than four feet long and weigh 120 pounds. In the wild, they can live up to 10 years. Capybaras live in family groups of up to 20 members. They're excellent swimmers. Their feet are webbed, and their store of body fat gives them almost neutral buoyancy. This old capybara is the dominant male of the group. The others keep out of his way. The large incisors can inflict savage wounds.
They seldom wander far from permanent water. Indeed, water is vital to the capybara in more ways than one. If its skin becomes too dry, it becomes ulcerated. When the flood is at its peak, capybaras are concentrated on high ground. When the flood recedes, they disperse throughout the Pantanal. In July, the flood continues to decline and the Vizantes, or water channels, become well-defined to form a vast network. Some pools of water become isolated from the main system. Shoals of fish are trapped in these pools. There's no escape. Wood storks and other wading birds arrive now to make the most of the available feast. They mass together and actually herd the fish. The egrets encircle the feeding mass of storks. And catch the fish that try to escape. The wood stork fishes with its bill open when it touches the fish, it snaps shut automatically, one of the fastest reflex actions known in nature. Because food is so easily caught at this time of year, many birds converge on the Pantanal. Wood storks carry food back to their breeding colony, which may be as much as 20 miles away. The Pantanal is among the world's most important breeding grounds for birds. This colony alone has about 20,000 pairs. Wood storks are the dominant species, but herons, egrets, and spoonbills nest here also, seeking safety in numbers. a young wood stork. Both adults feed the young. There are so many birds in this area that sometimes their droppings kill the vegetation. an egret's nest. The chicks are encouraging the parent bird to feed them by pecking at the upper part of the bill. The chicks are old enough to be mobile but can't fly yet. The roseate spoonbill feeds its young in a different way. The young spoonbill takes small crustaceans and aquatic insects from inside the parent's beak.
this young egret has fallen out of its nest and become an easy meal for an opportunist like the crested caracara. Young birds must be fully fledged by the end of August, when the floodwaters and their food supply will have dried up completely. Those that hatch late will not survive. Only diminishing pools are left now. The caiman have concentrated at these pools to feed on the stranded fish. Another pool inhabitant, a freshwater crab. This young caiman is about three years old and four feet long. He's been hunting in the territory of another larger caiman and is in great danger. The big caiman will not hesitate to kill the smaller one if he encroaches on his territory. to take his meal elsewhere. This one is almost nine feet long, weighs more than 300 pounds, and is probably over 50 years old. All other caiman give way to him. His teeth have penetrated his nostrils because they continue to grow throughout his life. Another caiman leaves the water to bask in the sun. but is in for a surprise. This heliconid butterfly is trying to drink the saline solution from its eyes. Butterfly searches for another caiman. It inserts its proboscis into the corner of the caiman's eye and drinks.
Finally, the caiman is driven into the undergrowth by a butterfly. September, and the floodwaters have gone, leaving only a narrow channel threading its way through the parched landscape. Only the deeper depressions still contain water. As it gets hotter, the fish trapped in the watery outposts will die by the thousands from lack of oxygen and provide easy meals for wading birds and carrion feeders. The caracaras must wait for the dead fish to be deposited at the water's edge. There are dead and dying fish everywhere. This caracara is so stuffed that it doesn't object when a second bird steals its fish. In the intense heat, a cormorant cools itself by fluttering its throat. A jabiru stork, the largest in South America. It's about five feet tall. Its red neck can expand as a warning when it's angry or upset. The skin on its neck is filled with small capillaries which help keep the bird cool. Unlike the wood storks, it does not breed in colonies, but builds an enormous solitary nest. It's reused year after year and may be 50 years old. To feed its young, the jabiru carries food in its crop, sometimes over great distances. The youngsters are half grown. Jabirus live throughout Brazil, and the name Jabiru means blown out with the wind. It's derived from an Amazonian Indian word and describes the bird's unusual neck. The parent regurgitates a whole fish, and the youngsters fight for it. The jabirus are not the only occupants of this nest. Monk parakeets take advantage of the stork's annual nest improvements and find plenty of room to nest within the huge structure. This bird is preparing the lining for its breeding quarters by stripping the leaves off twigs. As many as 20 pairs of monk parakeets can live in a jabiru nest.
Six months ago, the Pantanal resembled an inland sea. Now, once again, it's a prairie. The ants return to colonize the dry soil. They're followed by the giant anteater. When it discovers an ant's nest, it uses its powerful claws to rip it open. It pushes its snout into the opening and laps up the ants with its long, sticky tongue. The anteater has no jaws. Its nose and mouth are fused together to form a long, tubular snout. Coatis also move back onto the savanna. Relatives of the raccoon, they're omnivorous and travel in family groups. They call continuously to keep in contact with each other as they range over large distances, searching the dry land for food. A vast natural grassland, the Pantanal was bound to attract man's attention as a good place to raise cattle. But man, his cattle, and the wildlife have thrived side by side for the past 150 years. It's only in the past decade that new activities, such as draining the land for crops, pollution of the waterways, and caiman poaching, have posed a threat to the Pantanal. Many private landowners have banded together to preserve this irreplaceable natural heritage. And since less than 2% of the Pantanal is protected in refuges, its future is in their hands. Nature is made possible by public television stations, your gas company, and America's gas industry, developing new sources of gas energy and ways to use gas more efficiently for more than 160 million people across America.